I watched everyone packing up their stuff and stuffing it in their bags as I sunk lower and lower in my chair. I was ashamed of having just failed an important test and having been asked in front of everyone to stay behind and talk to my teacher. He sat on his desk with his hands on each side, the way teachers do when they're disappointed. I shamefully walked to the front and sat down, crossing my arms. But before I go on, please take a second to like and subscribe if you haven't already. We really appreciate it. Daniel, would you care to explain what led you to score so badly on the test? He asked in his usual proud tone. I didn't study, sir, I said simply. I was never the type to make excuses. I just didn't study and that was that. I've talked to your other teachers and you seem to be failing most classes, he said. We think you should get a tutor or you'll fail the year. I wanted to slap myself in the forehead. It was so embarrassing. Now I had to get tutored by some nerd. They were probably going to make me stay inside during breaks studying while watching my friends play basketball outside. I was already dreading the whole experience and it hadn't even started. The next day, my teacher really did make me stay inside during recess. He did that condescending thing where they put their hand on your shoulder and walked me to the library. It was mostly empty, but at the back I saw all the nerds my friends made fun of, talking about computer software or something like that. However, this one girl stood out. I caught myself saying, whoa, under my breath. I had never seen her before, because my school was huge. She was gorgeous. Everything from her hair to her smile and her bright eyes was mesmerizing. Who is she? I asked myself. I expected my teacher to take me to the back of the room and make me sit with the weirdos. But suddenly, I was face to face with the prettiest girl I had ever seen. Dan, this is your tutor, Molly, he said. And then he walked off muttering something about not getting paid enough and teenagers being the worst, as per usual. I was kind of speechless in front of my new tutor, Molly. It sounded like the most beautiful name because it was hers. Nice to meet you, Daniel, she said, smiling at me brightly. I tried to say something, but my voice cracked. I cleared my throat and said, You can call me Danny. She simply smiled and sat down, getting her books out of her bag. She started asking me a bunch of questions, but I couldn't hear a word she was saying. I was just staring at her. I had never been so dumbfounded. She waved her hand before my eyes and I snapped back into reality. Hello, you in there? She laughed. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I said. You're fine, she replied. She started asking me about the subjects I took and which ones I was struggling with the most. I was super embarrassed. I didn't want her to think I was stupid. I told her my worst subjects and she wrote them down. She wrote down everything I told her about why I struggled at school and took perfect notes. I could tell she was a good student. She was already studying me. Too soon for my liking, the bell rang and we had to get to class. We didn't have any classes together, which upset me, even though it had always been this way. Now when I was in class, I felt like she was missing. I'd look around expecting her to be there, but she wasn't. We started studying during recess and during periods when we were both free. Every word she said stuck in my mind. It all seemed like the most interesting stuff ever said. Soon enough, I had another batch of tests. And guess what? I aced all of them. Molly really turned my school life upside down. I was so filled with gratitude and I was so into her. I couldn't wait to tell her the news. When I saw her, I scooped her up in my arms and swung her around. I showed her my test results and she was just as happy as me. I couldn't help myself. I just had to do it. I asked her to be my girlfriend then and there. To my surprise, she actually grinned and said yes. I don't know why, but I kind of expected her to reject me. I was over the moon. She was on my mind 24-7 and now, hopefully, I'd be on hers too. After dating for three months, I wanted to give her a little surprise. It's corny, I know, but I wanted to celebrate our three-month anniversary. I bought her chocolates, flowers, and I wrote her a bunch of little notes. I stayed behind after school, telling her I had basketball practice, and when everyone was gone, I opened her locker. I was about to put all the gifts in for her to see first thing in the morning next day when she got to school, but something glimmered in the back of her locker. I reached for it, expecting it to be something light, but it was a very heavy book. A photo album. It was ratty, messy, and full of glitter. The glitter got everywhere on my hands and pants. I opened the first page and my mouth <gasps> fell open in shock. It was a picture of my history teacher, the same one who introduced me to her, and it was surrounded by hearts. 
Every page had a picture of a male teacher at my school surrounded by hearts, glitter, and different messages like husband or love of my life. I was so creeped out, but I hadn't even gotten to the worst part yet. I flipped through every page until I reached the last. It was a picture of three people. It was so unbelievable. It took me a second to process. It was a picture of me, my mom, and my dad. Kinda odd for it to take me a second to figure out it was my family, right? Well, that's because my mom's face was cut out and mine was angrily scratched up. It was like she took a pointy object and started scratching. My dad, on the other hand, he was perfect. He had even more hearts around him than all the teachers put together. Even more glitter and even creepier messages. My hands were cold, my face pale as I stared at this, this shrine to my dad. My girlfriend was obsessed with my dad. I didn't know what to do. I panicked, so I stuffed all the anniversary stuff in her locker and shoved the album in my backpack. I ran home as fast as I could. I needed time to think. The next day, Molly ran to me in the hallway and hugged me because she opened her locker and found all the gifts I had gotten her. She hugged me tight, but I just stiffened. Danny, you shouldn't have, she said, her cheek against my chest. She tried to kiss me, but I swerved it by pretending I had to sneeze. I avoided her the rest of the day. She tried to talk to me a bunch of times, but I dipped down and blended in with the crowd. Like I said, my school was huge. A few people told me she was looking for me and where she was, but I just used that info to avoid her even more. I watched her go to her locker at some point, hoping she wouldn't notice her album was gone. But, of course, she did. She started twitching. Sometimes her neck, sometimes her eyes. She looked like a person going through withdrawal. I was about to leave school at the end of the day when she grabbed my arm and, without saying a word, dragged me to the library. I wasn't about to make a scene in front of the entire school, so I let her drag me. She sat me down on one of the couches and reached out to touch my cheek, but I flinched. Danny, what's wrong with you? Why are you avoiding me? She asked me with pleading eyes, but not being able to stop scratching the back of her neck in nervousness. Nothing, Molly. She kind of flinched at me calling her by her name. I always called her by some sort of pet name. You're cold and distant. Just tell me what's wrong, she said, unexpectedly grabbing my hand. She looked down at it and she saw some remaining glitter on my hand and under my fingernails. She grabbed my other hand and examined it. I could see how she was connecting the dots in her mind. She looked up at me with a chilling gaze. I immediately stood up and ran out of the building. It was pretty late by that time and the sun was going down. I had biked to school that day so I got on my bike and pedaled as fast as my legs could. It still wasn't fast enough. I was biking on this poorly illuminated road with forest on both sides. The road was on higher ground than the forest. I saw a bright light approaching fast. It was only one, so I guessed it was a motorcycle. Soon I realized it was on the same lane as me, but clearly on the wrong side of the road. I wasn't sure what to do. Was it a drunk driver? The closer they got, the closer I could see the person on the bike. It was Molly. She looked absolutely deranged. She was driving full speed right at me. I realized she wanted to crash into me, and right before the moment of impact, I leapt off my bike and off the road, tumbling into the forest. My bike went flying. The motorbike was much heavier. I hid behind a thick bush and watched Molly searching for me with a flashlight. Where are you, Danny boy? Why won't you talk to me? She said in this creepy, angry baby voice. She ran into the forest and started pointing her flashlight around. She almost spotted me, but I ducked down just in time. While she was distracted, I ran to her bike. She almost caught me. I felt her fingernails graze my back. I rode off on her motorbike, much faster than she could ever go with my now-destroyed old bicycle. I rode all the way home, where I jumped off the bike and ran inside. I saw my parents in the kitchen, my dad reading a book out loud to my mom while she grabbed a plate for something. Oh, sweetie, you're finally home, my mom said. We were just about to eat these brownies your girlfriend brought over earlier. My mom grabbed a brownie and was about to take a bite of it when I slapped it out of her hand. I took the whole tray of brownies and threw them in the trash while my mom screamed at me, asking what the hell I was doing. They're poisoned, I screamed back. Daniel, what is the meaning of this, my dad asked, taking off his glasses. Molly's insane, I yelled at them. The doorbell rang suddenly, and my mom went to answer it. I tried to tell her not to, but she wouldn't listen. 
She came back and Molly was standing right behind her. I pushed her away from my mom, yelling, What are you doing here? at her. My dad grabbed me by the arms and pushed me away from Molly and my mom. What is the matter with you, Daniel? You don't push women, he reprimanded. I grabbed my backpack off the floor and opened the album. Molly shrieked not to open it, but I shoved the picture of my mom, my dad, and me under their noses. They both looked at Molly, shocked. Molly stomped and screeched. She ran to my dad and flung herself on him, screaming, Nothing will ever separate us. My mom got really mad at that, as she should, and clawed Molly off my dad as she kicked and screamed. She pushed the insane girl out of the house and screamed at her in our front yard. All the lights on our street turned on as nosy neighbors came outside to see what all the noise was about. But my mom ran back inside and locked the front door. Molly was left kicking, screaming, and banging on our front door and windows until the authorities arrived and took her away. She was so violent, they had to put her in a straitjacket. She lost her mind that day and was put in a psych ward. That year, I did end up getting amazing grades, but I still have nightmares of Molly looking for me in that forest. Let's just say, I do all my studying by myself now. Tutors can get weird. One night, I was walking home after closing up the diner late at night. I hated working so late, but I needed all the money I could get for college. It was dark and foggy, which I found odd. Suddenly, as I was walking past an alley, someone touched my elbow. It was an old man. He smiled at me, but I honestly panicked when he reached into his pocket. I'm a tall guy, so I thought I could most definitely take him in a fight, but I didn't want to fight an old man. Before I continue, remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you're the first to know when we release another awesome story. The old man reached into his pocket and pulled out a small piece of paper. He placed it in my hand, tipped his hat at me, and disappeared into the fog. I walked over to a street lamp and unfolded the small paper. It was a lottery scratcher. I chuckled, <laughs> thinking some crazy old man just gave me his trash. But the ticket wasn't scratched. I reached into my pocket and grabbed one of the coins I got in tips that night. I used the coin to scratch the ticket and shook my head, thinking I was seeing things. It said I had won a million dollars, but nah, it couldn't be, right? That only happens to the luckiest of the lucky, plus some sketchy old dude gave it to me. It's probably a fake. I shoved the ticket in my pocket and laughed at myself for believing it was real for a second. I threw my jacket on my nightstand when I got home and fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. The next morning, I saw the ticket as soon as I opened my eyes because it fell out of my jacket and was right next to me. I put it against the light seeping in through my curtains. Not gonna lie, it still looked kind of fake to me. After stretching, I walked numbly to the kitchen and made myself some breakfast. I was still looking at the ticket, mostly wondering why that old man gave it to me. Was he just trying to prank a kid? My gaze drifted towards the fruit bowl next to me. It was full of old scratchers that my mom had bought. She always had faith that we'd win something one day. I compared the scratcher to my mom's old ones. It started to look pretty real, but I still thought it was a prank. My mom then came into the kitchen. She was rubbing her eyes and yawning, but when she saw what I was holding in my hand, she jolted awake. Is that? Let me see. She snatched it out of my hand. I tried to tell her it was fake, but she was already jumping and hugging me. I didn't want to break her heart. Without even finishing my breakfast, she pulled me out of the house and dragged me to the post office. She was friends with the lady who worked there and sold scratchers. She basically shoved the ticket in the lady's face, and I was about to tell her that it was fake when the lady screeched and started jumping up and down, congratulating my mom. My mom proceeded to say it was my ticket, not hers, and the lady instead came up to me and started squeezing my cheeks, calling me a very lucky young man. I was still in shock when she shipped the ticket off to redeem the prize, and even more in shock when we were actually called to redeem the prize and get my money. I just stood there, flabbergasted in front of the cameras, holding an enormous check for a million dollars. My face was on the news next to the amount I had won. Everyone that knew me knew that I had just won a hell of a lot of money, but now I wish they hadn't known. When I went to school that Monday, I could immediately tell it was different. People swerved out of my way when I walked, or said hi to me when they had never done so before. My friends were actually very affectionate, which they weren't before. It took some getting used to, but after a few hours, I loved the attention. When my friends and I went to get lunch somewhere special, I paid, of course. I also paid for gas when we went to the beach, and for snacks, too. I even rented a boat one time, and we went out to sea. 
My friend, Rachel, dropped her phone in the ocean, so of course I had to surprise her with a new one. My friend Malik needed a new laptop, so I bought him one. One time, I even paid for everyone's lunch in the school cafeteria. The lunch lady just shook her head at me. They can afford their own stuff, you know. Don't let them take advantage of you, boy, she said, but I dismissed it. They were my friends. They wouldn't take advantage of me. I drove my friends to the mall one day and we spent hours shopping. First, we went to get video games for Jake. Then Rachel wanted a suitcase set and Malik said he needed a suit, so we got that too. I got the rest of my friends' stuff as well. I just honestly can't remember what it was. I was basically just swiping my card left and right whenever they told me to. On the car ride back to their respective homes, I was waiting for them to thank me, but they never did. They were all on their phones or taking pictures of their new stuff, and they ignored me when I tried to strike up a conversation. I was kind of pissed off. Was that how parents felt? My friends barely even said bye when I dropped them off at their houses. What the hell? I was mad when I got home. I felt like my friends were just using me, exactly like the lunch lady said they would. I was in class a couple days later with my friends Rachel and Malik. I put my earbuds in and put my head down after telling them I had a headache and needed a nap. I didn't play music though. Instead, I listened in on their conversation. You should just throw it in the bin or something, or just give it to someone else, Rachel said to Malik. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Bet he'll get me a new one without a second thought, laughed Malik. When the bell rang for lunch, I yawned and pretended to scratch my eyes. I watched as Malik pretended to accidentally throw his phone in the garbage at the front of the classroom and snicker with Rachel. I was fuming. I fished it right out and pretended I saw nothing. I got to our cafeteria and found a distressed Malik and a worried Rachel along with our other oblivious friends. I calmly asked Malik what was wrong and he went on a rant on how his parents were going to kill him because he lost his phone pretending to hyperventilate. I put my hand on his shoulder to calm him down. Then I pulled his phone out of my back pocket. See, your parents won't kill you because you just threw it in the trash expecting me to buy you a new one. Then I smashed his phone into the ground and hearing the screen shatter, I said, Damn, I guess they will kill you after all. And with that, I walked away. I distanced myself from everyone for a while. I ignored them in the halls and in class, and I blocked them on anything they could contact me through. They knew I needed the money to pay for college and for my siblings to also go to a good school, but they took advantage of me. It wasn't just my friends. If I went grocery shopping, people would pretend they forgot their cards and ask me to pay for them. I always pointed out that I could very clearly see their card in their back pocket. And then they'd mumble something about me being greedy. For real? Me? Greedy? Bold of them, honestly. I decided that I was going to stop paying for people's purchases and giving my money away to anyone and would instead make it interesting. I delivered flyers all over the neighborhood and to everyone from school. The news of what I was organizing spread like wildfire. At the school's annual festival, I had a mini lottery. I was giving away a third of all the money I won with my lottery scratcher. The festival was bigger that year than ever before. There were over a hundred people on school grounds, hoping to get a ticket and win some money. There were loads of tents with food and rides and booths for kids. As I walked around, I could tell people were buzzing with excitement, as they should, because they all thought they were gonna win. I left notes with people when I delivered flyers or told them in person that they were going to win. I told everyone that if they kept it to themselves, I would give them the winning ticket. Finally, the time came for the raffle. People gathered in the football field and I went around with a bag full of little tickets with numbers on them. I personally passed them out to people and smiled sheepishly at them as they winked at me or shook my hand, thanking me in advance. The last person who got a ticket was Marie Ann, the lunch lady. Her ticket, however, didn't come from the bag. It came from my pocket. She looked tired of having worked all day long. She sat down and I saw her rubbing her knee. That knee still bothering you, Marie Ann? I asked. Yeah, the doctor said it's pretty bad. She responded, deflated. I then walked up to the podium and tapped the mic. I made a little speech just to excite everyone more. And then I announced the numbers on the winning ticket. Seven, three, nine, two. Everyone was quiet. I heard some little what and curses. And then came a shrill scream and a laugh. Marie Ann was holding the winning ticket high in the air. I guess the adrenaline numbed her knee for a second because she managed to run all the way up to the podium and showed me her ticket. I smiled wide and shook her hand. It's what you deserve, I said to her. People around us started booing me, so I turned back to the mic and said, 
Every single one of you started taking advantage of me when I won my money. She is the only one who didn't change. All of you should be ashamed of yourselves. Two days later, I was closing up the same diner. I kept my job because that one was fun, and some extra money never hurt anyone. I started walking my normal route, but I felt some tingling in the back of my neck when I approached the alley. Suddenly, the old man walked out of it slowly, and I was face to face with him. The man started coming at me, so I squared up, but to my surprise, he hugged me. He hugged me tight, and it didn't feel weird at all for some reason. I knew you would do the right thing, he said to me, patting me on my cheek. His hand was oddly cold. I was still thinking about this encounter with the man when I arrived at home. For some reason, my eyes drifted towards the photo albums in my bookshelf. I never looked through those. I grabbed one that seemed to stand out. I looked through it absentmindedly, but a picture stood out. It was me as a baby, and I was on the shoulders of a man I had never seen before. That's when it hit me. The old man was my grandpa. The grandpa who had passed away when I was very young. When I tell people this story, they get scared. But honestly, all I feel is warmth and happiness. I had an ordinary life with an ordinary family and ordinary goals. But all that changed after I googled my family. I wish I never did it. But let me start from the beginning. The very beginning. I was born on the 2nd of November. I grew up with my parents in a small town with a really small population. I had no siblings, no grandparents, no aunts or uncles, but I didn't care. I had my parents, and that was all that mattered. My parents never really told me about my ancestors. I knew I was a mixed Italian-American, but that was the full extent of my knowledge. Other than that, I had no clue who my grandparents and other relatives were. But I guess it never bothered me growing up. I didn't really think about it. My parents never mentioned them, so I guess I didn't think about them either. But it wasn't until 6th grade, when my other friends at school would talk about going to their grandparents' house on the weekends, and the amount of presents they got on their birthday because of their relatives. I admit, I was jealous. Was I missing out? Why didn't I have any grandparents or relatives? How come my parents never spoke about them? I decided I would ask my parents about them. Why couldn't we be like a normal family? Why couldn't I have loads of relatives to bring me gifts? That night, I walked right up to my parents. Where are my grandparents, I asked. They looked at each other confused. What? said my mom. How come I don't have any grandparents? Everyone else at school does. Oh, began my dad. Well, he seemed to hesitate, but then he continued. They passed away, Franco. I paused. But what about my aunts and uncles? What about my cousins? My mom spoke up. Well, your father and I don't have any brothers or sisters, so that's why you don't have any aunts or uncles. I'm sorry, Franco. I was disappointed, but I believed them. It was a shame I didn't have any more relatives, but it didn't bother me too much. So for several years after that, I ignored it, and I never brought it up with my parents again. Until, that is, when I saw that news article. But more on that later. Something strange about my childhood was the fact that we moved around a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. We moved around yearly, sometimes even monthly, and I really struggled to make close friends. I just didn't have enough time to form a close enough bond with anyone. My parents always told me we moved around a lot because of their jobs, and I believed them. By the time I was 15, we had moved homes 50 times. 50! I didn't realize this was strange until one of my friends asked me where I used to live before, and I told him I lived a lot of places. He asked me how many, and when I said 50, he freaked out. What? he said in disbelief. What's wrong? I asked oblivious. That's crazy, dude. Why? Because you never even have time to live your life. You're too busy moving around. Why do you even have to move that often anyway? It's for my parents' work. What do they do? I paused. Come to think of it, I had no idea what they did for work. Was it something to do with accounting or marketing? But if I was being completely honest, I was just guessing. In truth, I had no clue. And actually, when I thought about it more, my friend was right. It was pretty weird how often we moved. That wasn't normal. And what kind of job did my parents have that forced them to move 50 times? I confronted them about it, but then seemingly out of nowhere, they started yelling at me, telling me to mind my own business. What had I done wrong? All I wanted was to know what their jobs were. 
Didn't I have the right to know why they had to uproot me from my life and force me to move every few months? Didn't I deserve to know at least? But they told me to go to my room and not bother them again. It was from that point on that I began to get suspicious. What were they hiding? Who did they really work for? Were my grandparents actually dead or was it just a lie? For the next few months, those thoughts and concerns swarmed in my head. My trust for my parents started to waver and I started to question every time we moved from home. It just didn't make any sense. But then, everything changed when I went on to Google. I had a history assignment where I had to research on events surrounding the mafia in the US. I was online when I came across this article on this mob boss or something. He was part of the mafia and he was now in jail for murder and countless other criminal charges. They showed a picture of him and I nearly choked on my cup of coffee. He was the spitting image of my dad. I had to rub my eyes and look at it again. If the date hadn't read over 50 years ago, I would have believed it was my dad. But it looked exactly like him. Did my dad have an older twin? And worst thing was, this man was wanted for murder. Then it struck me. Was he my grandfather? I called my dad and showed him the picture. When he came into the room and glanced at my computer screen, he nearly tripped over from the initial surprise. But he soon covered up his mistake by acting dismissive, but it didn't go past me. I saw his father. I saw the break in his facade. I knew he recognized this man. Was it because it was his father? When I asked him who this was, he told me not to think about it. I was still suspicious though. I decided to research a lot about it. What I found blew my mind. Another article showed this man had a son who had gone missing ever since his father was put into jail. This son had also worked in the mafia and he had been notorious for being the father's legacy. But with him gone, the family business was thrown out of balance. They were searching for this son and to this day, they were still searching for this son. He would be in his 40s now. When they showed a picture from when this son was around my age, I literally felt my mind explode. It was me. It looked exactly like me, but that wasn't possible. I wasn't alive 40 years ago. But then, sudden realization hit me like a punch to the face. It looked like me because this was my father. My father was the son of a mob boss. And that wasn't even the worst part. Apparently, my father had had a really dark past. He was wanted for fraud and scams and murder. My father was a wanted man for murder. Now this was too much for my mind to comprehend. Everything I knew about my parents was thrown out the window. I started to Google my family name, Romano, and a whole bunch of articles showed up about the Romano family and their criminal past, how they were involved in some of the highest criminal schemes in history. I was part of that family. Generations of criminals lay in my bloodline. I was too shocked to search for any more results. This was too much. What does this mean? Was my dad a criminal? Was he wanted? If the cops found out about my dad, would he go to jail? I decided there was only one thing left to do. I had to speak to my parents, and I wouldn't let them dismiss me like they usually did. I wanted the truth, and I wouldn't take anything else for an answer. That night at dinner, I confronted them at the dinner table. I told them all about the mafia and the article I had seen, and dad's picture. How he was wanted for murder. My parents were shocked, but then their expressions hardened. They didn't answer me at first. They just looked at each other and a silent agreement seemed to pass through them. To this day, it still scares me about the fearless look on their faces. Come on, we'll explain it all to you, said dad. I blinked again. Wait, what? No, you're right, he said. It's time you knew the truth. They stood up from the table and walked into the hall. I was still surprised by their sudden leniency, but I followed them through. They headed to the attic. Was there something hidden up there? Any clues? Newspapers from dad's past? What could possibly be up there? They climbed the ladder and disappeared into the darkness. When I followed them, I couldn't see a thing. Where are you? I called out. Then, I heard the attic door slam shut. I jumped, rushing toward its hatch. I could hear my parents below talking quickly. Hey, let me out, I cried. It's for your own good, sweetie, called my mom. I shook the hatch door, trying to rattle it off its hinges, but it didn't budge. My parents had locked me in the attic. I was trapped. I couldn't believe it. How could they do this to me? I couldn't even trust my own parents. This had to mean it was true, right? 
Why else would they have locked me up in here? I started to worry about the things they may do to me. I knew too much. I could blow their cover. Would they leave me here forever? Would I ever have a normal life again? I banged on the door again. Should I call the police? A whole night passed. I had to sleep in the attic with mice crawling all through the roof. Eventually, in the morning, they came back up to me. They opened the attic door and I didn't hesitate. I flew through, sprinting down the hall. They called at me to come back, but I wouldn't have it. No, Franco, let us explain it to you, called Dad. His voice sounded so sincere. Reluctantly, I turned around. Fine, what is it? He looked at my mom and took a deep breath and explained everything. My father hadn't murdered anyone. He had been framed. A rival gang had pinpointed him for their attack since he had secured a deal that hadn't worked well for them. My dad was innocent. He had been born into that mafia life and he wanted a fresh start. That's when he met my mother. He decided to change his identity. I didn't know what to think. So my father was innocent? He hadn't murdered anyone? I wasn't sure. But then I looked into his eyes and I believed him. I asked them why they had locked me in the attic. Why not just explain all this to me first? They said they needed to get all their stuff ready first. That's when I noticed the packed bags lying in the hallway. So we were moving again. I sighed, but it felt easier once I knew why we were moving. From that point on, we decided to keep my father's past a secret. It was for the best. We always feared what my father's father, the mob boss, my grandfather might do. Would he betray my father? If he got out of jail, would he come searching for him? But so far, nothing has happened. We still remain under fake identities. And of course, I'm not going to tell you our real names. All the names you heard in this video were all fake. Yeah, my name isn't really Franco Romano. So don't bother trying to find us. My name is Brian. I'm 15 years old and I have the perfect life. I have only one regret. I wish I had never seen my parents' search history. That's the day my whole world changed. Let me tell you how it all began. But before I go on, make sure you like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any more crazy stories. I grew up in Florida. My life was amazing. I was an only child and my parents adored me. They gave me everything I always wanted. I had the best clothes and the latest phone and I was captain of the school baseball team. We won all the competitions and my room was full of bright, shiny trophies. I was always surrounded by friends at school. We had so much fun. On the weekends, if I wasn't playing sports, then I was at the beach with my friends or shopping for the latest designer clothes to wear. I got invited to the best parties in town. My girlfriend's name is Molly. Molly is so pretty. She's tall and blonde and all the boys liked her. I met Molly at the local diner. She was with a group of her friends. I walked in and our eyes met across the room. Molly looked away, giggling with her friends. I was sure she liked me. I walked over to their table. Hi, I said, I'm Brian. Hi, I'm Molly, she replied. I asked Molly if she would like to go to the movies with me. She said yes, and that's when my life became perfect. Until the day I came home from school and everything changed. I came home from school and ran up to my bedroom. I was a little stressed as I had so much homework to do. I wanted to get it all finished quickly so that I could go to see Molly later. I switched on my laptop. Nothing. Not a thing. I ran down to the kitchen where mom was getting dinner ready. My laptop won't work, I shouted at mom. I have so much work to do. What am I going to do? It's okay, replied mom. You can use dad's computer tonight. I'll get you a new computer tomorrow. I breathed <sighs> a sigh of relief and went over to dad's computer. It was still switched on from this morning when dad was using it before he went to work. Dad works for a huge international shipping company. They have offices all around the world. For as long as I can remember, we've traveled to so many exotic places because of Dad's work. Japan, England, South Africa. As I glanced at Dad's computer, I wasn't surprised to see Australia in his search history. I guessed that was the next place we would be going to visit. Until I looked more closely, that is. Why would Dad be searching for houses for sale in Sydney, Australia? The next search was even more terrifying. Looking to relocate your whole family to Australia. What was going on? I looked over at mom. She was smiling to herself as she prepared dinner. She couldn't know what dad was planning. She would be as upset as I was when she found out. Dad came in from work. He sat down at the kitchen table. Mom passed him a cup of tea. She did the same thing every night. I waited. Then, taking a deep breath, I asked, 
Dad, why are you looking at houses for sale in Australia? <gasps> Dad looked shocked. He looked at Mom, <gasps> but she looked just as shocked. I'm sorry, Brian. I wanted to tell you myself, he said. My company has offered me a job in Australia. We're moving at the end of this month. No, I shouted. I don't want to go live in Australia. What about all my friends? What about Molly? All these thoughts were rushing through my head. I wanted to scream. Mom, did you know about this? I asked. Yes, darling, she replied. It's going to be fantastic. You will make new friends and have a wonderful life. I don't want new friends, I shouted. I grabbed my coat and ran out of the house. I ran all the way to Molly's house. She was shocked to see me so upset when I arrived. What is it? She asked. My parents are taking me to Australia, I said. My life is ruined. Molly was upset too at the thought of me leaving, but she tried to cheer me up. We can still speak every day, she said. She didn't want me to worry about leaving her. I knew she was just trying to make it easier for me. I only had one more month with Molly. I went out with her every day. We wanted to make the most of our last days together. As the end of the month drew near, Molly said she thought it would be better if we didn't see each other as much. We had to get used to being on our own again. I knew she was right. Molly didn't cry when we said goodbye. She just smiled at me and said, Have a wonderful time. I will be waiting for you. Our last week in Florida went by in a flash. We had to pack up our whole house and say goodbye to all of our family and friends. I was still really angry about having to leave. I knew I was going to hate living in Australia. The flight to Australia was long. After all, it's the other side of the world. When we left Florida, it was the middle of winter. When we arrived in Australia, it was the middle of summer. It felt very weird. My dad's company had organized a car to meet us at the airport and drive us to our new house. As we pulled up at the gates to the house, I was really surprised. The house was huge. They had a big swimming pool in the back garden. I thought it looked nice, but I wasn't going to tell my parents that. What do you think, Brian? Asked Mom. It's okay, I guess, I mumbled. We went into the house. Mom showed me which room was mine and told me to unpack my bags and take a shower. I went into the bathroom and let out an enormous scream. Mom and Dad came flying up the stairs to see what was wrong with me. I pointed to the bath. In the bath was the biggest spider I had seen in my life. Dad just <laughs> laughed at me. It's okay, Brian, he said. It's not going to hurt you. This wasn't a good start. I knew things would only get worse. We had been in Australia for only a few days, but it was time for me to start school. My new school was only a 20-minute walk from our house. Do you want me to walk with you? My mom asked on the first day. Of course not, I snapped. I'm not a baby. But secretly, I wished she could come with me. I didn't want to start a new school. I walked through the school gates and into class. Everyone was already sitting in their chairs. I walked over to the only spare chair and sat down. Everyone was staring at me. The teacher came in and introduced me to everyone. A few people smiled at me. Then, the teacher asked me to tell everyone a little bit about myself. That's when it all went wrong. As soon as I started talking, everyone started laughing. The teacher tried to stop them, but they just carried on. At lunchtime, it only got worse. Everyone else spoke with a different accent to me. They used words that I didn't understand. I went and sat on my own in the corner. I didn't want to try to make friends as I knew they would just laugh at me again. When I got home, I ran straight to my room. Checking careful for spiders on the way, I threw myself down on my bed. I hate this place. I hate school, I said to myself. I didn't make any friends at school. I didn't get invited to parties. Everyone thought I was weird. One day, I was walking along the corridor at school and saw everyone gathering around the notice board. There was a note there. They were looking for students to play on a school baseball team. My heart leapt. Finally, there was something that I enjoyed doing. I put my name on the list. The next day was the first practice after school. I changed into my sports clothes and went along to the field. When I arrived, there was only one other boy there. Hi, he said. I'm John. I was surprised. I hadn't seen John around school before. Mind you, our school was really big, so I didn't know all of the students. Hi, I'm Brian, I replied. I expected John to laugh at my accent, but he didn't. He just wanted to talk about baseball. He told me how he had always wanted to play baseball, but had never had the chance. We were soon chatting away, and by the time the other boys arrived to play, we were firm friends. After practice, John asked me if I wanted to go to his house. I rang mom, and she said it was fine. She sounded really happy that I had found a friend. It was amazing how much we both had in common. We were the same age. In fact, our birthdays were on the same day. 
We both loved playing computer games. We had even both been given a kitten when we were younger and had chosen the same name, Kitty. In some ways, we looked a little like each other too. Maybe that's why we had become good friends straight away. From then on, we were inseparable. At school, we sat together eating our lunch and planned what we would do on the weekend. Mom was so happy that I had finally settled into school. You must invite John over for dinner, she said. I'll ask him, I replied. We organized for John to come over on Saturday to my house. I had a big day planned. We would swim in our pool, go out on our bikes. Dad said he would make a barbecue. He felt sure John would enjoy that. I was waiting at the front of our house on Saturday morning when I saw John riding his bike towards us. I waved and he came over to me. Let's go straight in the pool, I said. I shouted to mom that John had arrived and we were going for a swim. Mom said that she would bring us some lemonade in a while. We were happily splashing about in the pool when I saw mom come out of the kitchen door. She took one look at John, dropped the tray of drinks on the floor, and let out a tiny scream. What was wrong with mom? She looked like she'd seen a ghost. Dad came running out of the house to see what was going on. Mom said something to him and dad looked over at John. His face turned white. He walked over to us. I think you two boys had better come into the house, he said. I wondered what was going on. John looked a bit worried. We followed mom and dad into the house and sat down. We have something to tell you both, dad said. Dad went on to explain what had shocked mom so much. When I was born, I actually had a twin brother. There'd been a mix up at the hospital and the doctors had given my twin brother away to another family. This family had moved to Australia. Mom and dad had spent 15 years trying to find their other son, my brother. They had finally found him living in Sydney. His name was John. That's why dad decided we had to move to Australia. I looked at John, he looked at me and it finally clicked. That was the reason we were so alike. We weren't just good friends, we were twin brothers. Mom and dad had come looking for John, but we had found each other first. Hello, I'm Tara, and a few months ago, I found out my dad is living a secret life. It completely turned my family's world around and ruined all of our lives. I really wish I had never discovered my father's double life. Now, I don't know how to fix the mess I begun. I've always been incredibly curious ever since I was a little girl. If I sensed a mystery going on around me, I immediately needed to find the answer to it. So my dad's weird behavior clearly caught my eye and I decided to do some research, which led to my life being destroyed. Before telling you about my dad's secret, let me tell you a bit about my family. You can't quite understand what happened without knowing more about them. I am the youngest of three daughters. Cindy and Rose are two and four years older than me, and we've always been really close. My childhood was a happy one, playing around the backyard with my siblings. Mom was always around, taking care of us and taking care of the house. She was a stay-at-home mother and not a lazy one. She cooked, cleaned, and always had time to play with us and help us with our homework. Dad was a great provider. He had a good salary and made sure we wanted for nothing, often arriving with pretty gifts like dresses and toys for us. The truth of the matter was, we were happy, or so it seemed. My dad was incredibly loving, but always seemed so busy. We understood he worked long hours and had to take regular business trips outside the city. It was normal to us, and we never questioned it, at least not until he began acting sloppy. You see, after so many years of sneaking around, my dad grew lazy, believing we'd never catch up to his weird activities. He was wrong, and this mistake ended up messing everything up. Everyone in the house began noticing some odd behavior from him. He'd arrive later than usual, keep his phone away from the entire family, and check his messages in a rush. If it was work, would he be so antsy when he read his emails? I thought that didn't make any sense, so I decided I needed to investigate what was going on. He even stepped outside to make phone calls, which seemed normal at first, but paired up with the rest of his strange attitudes, it made me feel even more suspicious. My mother was completely oblivious to his attitude, but I think she was trying to turn a blind eye to the whole situation. Now I think that maybe I should have done the same thing. One day when my dad was out shopping, I sat down at his laptop and tried to unlock it. Much to my surprise, his password was incredibly easy to guess. It was his birthday. 
I rolled my eyes at how silly he was, but my amusement didn't last long. He had several tabs open, and one of them was his email. I browsed through it, and the more I read, the worse it got. I was completely shocked by what I saw. Dad was messaging another woman. She called him by another name, a fake name, and apparently had a child with him. There were pictures of my dad with this other woman and my half-brother, who was at least 10 years younger than me. I felt sick. How could my dad do something so horrible to us? Betray my mom and lie to his family? I took screenshots of the whole thing and rushed to speak to my sisters, looking for advice. They were as furious as I was, and in the end, after much debate, we decided to tell mom about it. How could we keep a secret like that from her? Mom honestly didn't believe us at first. I think she wanted to ignore the truth, really, but we wouldn't let her. I showed her the evidence I had collected, and it was then that she was forced to confront the truth. Everything spiraled out of control after that. Mom confronted our dad and kicked him out of the house. How can I blame her for doing that? He was lying to all of us, not only cheating on mom, but hiding an entire family from his daughters. Mom filed for divorce the following week, and this situation has completely torn our close-knit family apart. I feel miserable and haven't seen my father in over two months. I know I have a half-brother out there and don't even know how to get in contact with him. Dad doesn't pick up the phone any longer, and my sisters and I are heartbroken. The truth of the matter is, I wish I had never decided to research my dad's dark secret, since I would still have him in my life, and my family wouldn't have been destroyed. I feel so responsible for this whole mess, but I know my dad is the one to blame. He lied to us all, and now he's completely disappeared on us. He's our father, and should be brave enough to face the music now that his mistakes were discovered. If you are listening to this, Dad, give us a call. We're still mad at you, but we really miss you. Thanks for watching. Do you have any advice on how to deal with this problem? Leave a comment and tell us about it. And don't forget to subscribe and check out the other videos on the channel.